certainly happy this afternoon for the privilege of being in one of the few churches that still worship in the Spirit. I think it's just wonderful to come here to uh, just to feel that uh, consolation of just letting the Spirit of God flow. I've had my tape boy here to take the those chants of the Lord, the rhythm like of the, the people as they're moving by the Spirit uh, on tape. I had that for a purpose. I asked him to come for that. And uh, so glad that the Lord permitted it to happen again this afternoon, for I was expecting it. Now, reading this letter from Jamaica, as our precious brother Smith has so graciously did, the two letters, uh, just reminds me of when we were there. You might know that the uh, hope of 
faith, is that what the, your paper's name there? Herald of Hope. That paper did one of the greatest advertising jobs that we had in Jamaica. Brother Smith was well m better known than anybody on the island, be uh, Harley, because of the, the paper. Your paper has a great influence and packs a, uh, a great a thing for the Lord wherever it goes. I held my hand a while ago because it's sent to me. It's uh, certainly a grand paper. May God let it travel to the four corners of the earth and do great work. Long live this church and may the Spirit never leave it. Don't never compromise with the things of the world. Keep that. If you have to be so poor that there's just six of you left, stay right with that Spirit. See, just leave that. Uh, just stay right with that worship. You know, today we have so many different programs and so many announcements and so much that just takes up the time. And it takes away that feeling of worship. But I was speaking to Brother Mercer and I said, just you can just relax. Just don't make any effort. Just just feel like it's something. I think it would be good for this nervous, neurotic world just to enter into places like this. Amen. It would be healing for them. Amen. Just to quieten. Today's been a terrible day for me and... So many calls and so forth, and and the phones are ringing everywhere, and and I was walked in here. Brother Mercer said, "I can tell you're nervous," and I said, "Who wouldn't be?" But now I'm quite just the singing and relaxing, and I, I just love that. I feel if we should just say Amen and go home, the Lord would. It would pay us everyone to have been here in this wonderful atmosphere. And this is one of the few that's left. As they tell me that all Pentecostal worship used to be like that years ago. Wished it would return. For I think we need to go back to the old path. Just where the Spirit has the right of way. I love that. And did you notice no matter who it was, what message they have... Everybody's give consideration. See, just uh, sometimes they see in the church, they'll think maybe some person say that wasn't of the Spirit and just let it go on. But it, it isn't so with Brother Smith. He just, whoever it is, it, he just lets, what, if it's the Lord, it's the Lord. If it isn't, it mounts nothing anyhow. So he just, I, I, I like that. I like that. And it doesn't hurt feelings. It just brings a love, as someone spoke in a word of prophecy a few moments ago, it just makes everybody feel at home, see. And I think that's really nice. May it never cease to be that way, is my prayer. For there's lots of times I like to come in here and just rest. And I'd like to come over here and just relax like this for a while. I got on tape now, so I'll just get real nervous. I'll just turn on the tape and relax. I'll be at Pisgah. <laughs> Maybe the tape could catch the rhythm of it and God will furnish the spirit of it just to, to hear it when I feel real upset. Because, you know, there's so many emotions and so many things to detract us from the spirit today. It's real nice to be here reading these letters of the healing. And I'm, I would like to say this, being that this is not any... I just want to be sure it wasn't on the air. Um, you know, I, um, I like to hear them kind of letters because, you see, I'm not no divine healer. I, I never did claim to be that. And I have no f fancy ways of, of doing things. I, I just, I've had a lot of answer to prayer and that's about all I can say. Just, just uh, God has been good to me to answer my prayer. See? That's all I ever did to anyone would just pray for them. And I, I think that's about all we can do, don't you, Brother Smith? Did you, did just pray. That's all. God promised to answer prayer. And I, that's just what I like. And I don't have anything that says you're going to get healed. And when I do certain things, uh, lay my hands on you, you're going to be healed. I just believe God answers prayer. And I just pray. And he, he, the letters come in and they get healed. So that's... Just about it. Now, 
I'm grateful for the opportunity to have to speak to this um, gathering this afternoon, this fellowship of the Pisgah Church, and I do not know just what it all consists of, but I hear that there's ministers and businessmen and the laity and all of us here together. So tonight, reason I announced at the Angelus Temple last night what I would do tonight because I thought I would be late here, usually for the, uh, the uh, what would I call the discernment or so forth. I usually go to prayer by three o'clock and not bothered no more from that on to the time. But tonight, I said I'd take up all the prayer cards and pray for the sick tonight at the temple and starting a series of messages on, on uh, Abraham from the scripture. Now, just before I take my text for a few moments, let's bow our heads again just a minute. Lord, I'm so blessed by being here in your presence today. So glad that there is still a remnant that keeps the Spirit of the Lord moving in their midst by their consecration and and their love and devotion to Thee. Lord, bless this church. Since a little boy, I've heard of it. And I pray, Lord, that Your blessings will continue to be here. Keep them humble. Bless the pastor and all the co-workers and all that takes to make up such a, a place. We pray that You will bless them. Bless their paper, for it is a, it's a great blessing to others who read it. And may all that's accomplished be to thy honor and glory. Now may we settle our minds now after the worship on the word for a few moments. And we, we pray, God, that this being the house of judgment, where we come under the old oak as it was to rest and to to get new orders and to go forth into the harvest field again, to preach and to reap the harvest. Grant, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will speak for we ask it in the name of thy Son, the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Uh, For a text, I would like to use the 14th verse of, of the 22nd chapter of St. Matthew. For many are called, but few are chosen. And for a subject, I would like to use God's provided way. Now, we hear so much today of the second coming of the Lord. And truly, that's what we are all waiting for. The coming of the Lord. And I truly believe that we are near that great event. The greatest event that ever did happen is, or ever could happen is just near its being made manifest now. That is His coming. Amen. The church has waited for this time for 2,000 years. And we are seeing the unfolding of the Scriptures. Jesus in the light of Calvary, just a few hours before He was crucified, spoke more of His second coming than He did of His crucifixion. So it must be a great thing that lies just ahead. And now that we are gathered ministers and Christian businessmen, laity, track workers, and the ones who does different types of ministry, I think that we ought to kind of check up while we're under the shade of the cross this afternoon. And that God would give us something in our hearts to go out from here with. Yes. 
Some time ago, I was in Finland, and I was coming down the road in a, a little automobile. And in Finland, the people are poor, and the young ladies are out in the field with the old-fashioned sigh cradle to cut the wheat and bind it with some of the sheaves. And many of them had gathered under a great big tree for to have their lunch. And I thought it was a good time to speak because I had an interpreter with me. And we stopped just for a few minutes where twenty some odd people had gathered out of the harvest field under the shade of a large tree. And I spoke to them about the love of the Lord and told them that I'd heard about how that after the war they had to run the, the hires. They didn't have time to uh, plow the fields because the winter was coming on. And they... Uh, just had to pull the harrows behind them to scratch the surface of the ground to get the seed in the ground. For if they did not get the seed in the ground, there would be no harvest next year and all would perish. And at night time, the women, the man, no horses, animals to pull it, the people had to pull the harrow. And there was no drones in the camp. They had to, the little children went before them with a lantern at night time to make a light so that they could uh, put the seed in the ground and run before mama, the little fellows, while little brother was resting for the next shift. They must scratch the ground some way. They didn't have time to plow. For it was too late in the season had to get the grain in the ground quickly. If not, there would be no harvest. And I think while we're together, together, we should think that it's later than you think. Yeah. Scratch the ground anyway. Yeah. We haven't got time for seminaries and to learn a whole lot of things, uh, but we've got to get the Word to the world. Scratch the surface some way and sow the Word. Day and night. For if there is no, no grain in the ground, there can be no harvest for the coming of the Lord. While I was talking to that bunch of little Finnish people, 17 received the baptism of the Holy Spirit just a few moments afterwards. Oh. Me, the time is closed. We must hurry. So we should think and how we should meet this great thing that we are doing now. Education has failed and all the other man-made things has failed. We see it has. And our denominational barriers has brought barriers between the people to make them argue and carry on about their denominations. But I believe that we have fail to get the thing that Jesus gave to us to give to the church, to give to the people. You know, I think before we leave this afternoon, we should check up and see what our Lord was talking about when He wrote this parable, or said it rather. You see there, we should know how to tell the people to prepare for this great event that's coming. If the coming of the Lord is so great, it's the most essential thing that we can do is to get the people prepared for it. Yes, amen. Because if He comes and we're not prepared, then we'll be left out. But we must prepare the way of the Lord with this, our message from Him. Because there is a way the Scripture speaks of that seemeth right unto a man. There is a way that seems all right. But the end thereof is the ways of death. So what if people are prepared in the wrong way? What if soldiers went to the field not trained for battle but to go out there to 
to dance. Though they, they would, might be ever so good dancers, they've got to be trained to fight. What if they went out there to, to have some other kind of an affair and know not how to use their gun? They would do little good. So I think that the workers in the harvest should be prepared to know how to train the people for the coming of the Lord, for there is none of us but what wants to meet it. And I believe that we are living so close to the coming that these great miraculous things that we see appearing is the indication of His soon coming. Now Jesus taught this parable. And if you almost have to have an oriental view of the scriptures before you'll ever be able to understand the parables. Because the Bible is an oriental book. We are a western people. Looking at the Bible from an oriental, a western standpoint when it is an oriental written word. For it was wrote... 2,000 years ago. Where the meanings are the same. But if you ever go to the East, the Bible will be a new book for you. Its meanings, its interpretations will seem so much brighter. Now, I do not mean to say that we don't know how to be saved in the order of the Scriptures. But I mean to say this, that it'll just brighten it for you when you see the way Jesus taught in that day in the oriental customs and they haven't changed one bit. They're just exactly today like they were then. So that man would not get mixed up that these things that we are now so mixed in would not happen. Jesus taught the people in parables. Now, as this wedding supper, of course, we all know that the wedding supper is in the future. That when all the redeemed of all ages come up before the presence of God, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, and stand there washed in His blood and wrapped in the robe of His righteousness, then we'll have that great wedding supper that'll be spread across the skies. And I think of that day that many of us here is getting down along in the way with gray hair streaking and shoulders bent. While about 90% of our audience this afternoon are over the halfway mark, as we call it. And many of you has worked and struggled and done without and sacrificed and to get the message of the gospel over. And I'm thinking about that day when it's all over and the wedding supper is set and we sit down across the table from one another. I'm sure if, if I'm Blessed by the Lord to get to be there. I look where I say, I met you at Pisgah, didn't I? When we meet one another on the other side. And talk about the times that when we come together like this to take instructions on how to go out and to win souls. And look down along that long line, Papa and Mama and all of them present of that won't be a wonderful time, that wedding supper. We'll reach across the table and take each other by the hand, grip each other's hands, and I'm sure a little tear will run down our cheeks for our appreciations of God's grace getting us there. Then the king will come out and wipe all tears, as I've many times said from our eyes. Say, don't cry no more. Them days are finished now. Enter into the joys of the Lord that's been prepared for you since the foundation of the world. And we all want to be there. And we want 
all that we can get to be there because it's urgent. The time is past and we're waiting for his coming. Did you notice he said when he sent forth first, the first group, they come back and they had excuses made. All they had this or that to do. The king supper, of course, is God. The son is Christ, the son of God. And we, the bride, are the one that's invited. The bride is, would be the whole earth is invited. Yeah. Everybody's invited. But there's some things that we've got to do before we can ever attend that wedding supper. Yeah. I, in the Orient, when uh, there was to be a wedding, what taken place? The king... Set the time for his son's wedding. And then it was the son's duty to give out the invitations. And no one could come to that supper without an invitation. And I don't believe that there has ever been a man or a woman that ever walked into a church or come in the presence of God without they were given an invitation to this supper. Now, you can take it or you can turn it down. That's up to you. Some people go to church year after year and uh, day after day, revival after revival, and still will not accept that invitation. They don't mean to turn it down, but they just neglect doing it. Did you notice one had something to do? He had bought a piece of ground. The other one had uh, bought some ox and he must go try them. Not like he wouldn't try the ox before he bought them. You see, it's just, it's just an excuse. And I know that all you ministers and so forth and businessmen and track works and so forth, you all find those things. People's got excuses. I, I've just got to stay home tonight. I can't attend the revival. Just remember, God said they'd do that. They're turning down their invitation. Now, let's look at it again. And one he did this, his wife wouldn't let him come. And, and that's another excuse. There should be nothing to stand between us and that invitation. If it costs a yoke of ox or your business or your, your wife or your children or anything, nothing should separate us from that invitation. God's called you to His harvest field or to do something for Him. There should be nothing stand between you and God. It must come first. The invitations given out. Now when the invitations was given out, the excuses was made. Then back they come and said, they won't come. Now if you notice the last time that He sent them out was to go into the hedges and highways and byways get the lame, halt, and blind and compel them to come in. For God is determined that His table will not be set and there will be nobody there. God wants His tables full. The fatlands has been killed. Everything's been fixed and everything's ready. And if you'll notice the last great message that was to go was to go into the highways and byways now, I like that about this little church here feeding the poor taking in the lame the halt the withered praying for the sick and I leading this little sign here what give me the idea and the lame shall walk it said certainly the last calling and the last invitation was a great time to sweep across the country in divine healing that was the last and we're winding up the end of that just pulling in the loose ends right now so how close is the coming of the Lord go into the hedges and byways bring them in compel them to come bring in the lame the halt the blind they have the healing service the healing service for divine healing is, 
is never the principle of any meeting. It shouldn't be. We don't uh, just uh, take the service for healing only. As Brother Bosworth used to say, divine healing is like the bait on a hook. You don't show the fish the hook. You show him the bait. And he grabs the bait and gets the hook. So that's the way it is by divine healing. It brings the people together. And then the hook is the gospel that catches the fishes for God's kingdom. Now, before anyone could attend, what if you got tonight an invitation to go to the, uh, the president of the United States and to attend his son's supper, you would say. If the president's son was going to have a supper and you just a poor man on, out here working for a living like we all do, what a blessed thing it would be if somebody come and give you an invitation from our beloved President Dwight Eisenhower to attend the great wedding banquet that he had set. Now, you know that you'd brag about it. Why you'd go all over Los Angeles yeah. telling the people, look what an important person I am. Yeah. Sure. The President of the United States has invited me to the wedding supper. Why, it would be an honor for you to attend that wedding supper. It would be an honor. You'd be a selected person to attend that wedding supper. And I'm sure that the President wouldn't send you such an invitation unless he thought that you surely would accept it. But what do you think would take place if you sent him word back, I don't want to come? How that would hurt his feelings. Well, then what do you think it would be? Because God has invited you to attend that wedding supper. They, people say, the people that's got the Holy Spirit brag too much about it. We can't brag enough about it. It's something to crow about. We are invited to the wedding supper of the Son of God. It's worth walking on the street and testifying and telling every creature you come in contact with how a good thing it is that you're invited to the wedding supper. God Almighty has selected you from the slums of the earth to attend the wedding supper of His beloved Son. Oh, what an invitation that is. It's worth a hundred billion president's suppers to attend that supper. Now, if Mr. Eisenhower knew that you didn't have clothes fit to wear, then of course he would make arrangements for that. And that's exactly what God did. He made arrangements that you should be dressed in a certain way. Because, you remember, he said, call the good and the bad. Call all of them together. Don't make any difference what your past life has been. When you've got an invitation to come, you're ready to come. If you've been bad, if you've been a streetwalker, if you've been a gambler, if you've been a drunkard, if you've been a murderer, no matter what you've been, if God gives you the invitation, knocking at your heart, He'll take care of the rest of it. Amen. Don't worry. You say, well, I've just been a lukewarm church member. He'll still take care of it. If you'll just take heed to that invitation. And you say, what is the invitation? Whosoever will, let him come and drink from the waters of a life freely. The invitations to whosoever will. And now... In the Orients, the son that gave the, whose wedding it was to be, had to furnish the robes. No man could come without first he wore a robe. Here's why. Because if one come, a nice rich woman come with a, a flowerly hats and, and a rich man come with a tuxedo on, and the next man, woman, come with one of those little, um, I thought I could think of that, gingham, gang, 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 gingham, whatever what it is. One of them kind of skirts on, and, uh, and the next woman had on a silk skirt. I'll tell you what this old-time religion will do for you. It'll make a 
gingham skirt and a silk skirt put their arms around one another and call them sister, it'll do that. It'll make a tuxedo hug a pair of overhauls and holler, brother, husband. That's what it'll do. It'll take the starch away from you. Yes, but in this oriental way of doing it, there was robes so that they would all look alike. I'm so glad of that. Even my old Kentucky broke up way, no education. Still, I can wear the robe because he gave it to me. He invited me and I accepted it. No matter how you might be, the robe covers. The, it makes the difference. See, is the robe. Now, God made a robe also to cover. That's the blood of Jesus Christ. By the Holy Ghost. The robe. Now, when the people come, they brought their invitation. Now, here's where I think that our crude mistake has been. Not us, but I don't mean to say the full gospel. People, I'm not speaking to them. But I mean like, with no disregards to ministers, such great man. And man that I honor. And man that I respect with all my heart. I don't know a person on the field that I can honor and respect any more than Billy Graham for the great work that he's doing. I seen him the other night preaching right where I'm to follow him now with his eyes black here from that blood clot and and they set signs on the street so the news said, boot him, go back. Even when old robbers turned back, Billy Graham stayed with it until he hammered it through. I tell you, I've got respect for Billy Graham. That's exactly right. Jack Schuler, And then Mr. Graham said one time that he, he wondered why when he was in Louisville that when Paul went forth and took the Bible, held it up like this, and he said at the, biz, at the Christian's breakfast that morning, the ministerial breakfast, rather, he said, you know, when Paul went forth and got one convert, the next year he come back and there was 30 from that one. But said, I'll go into a city and hold a several weeks campaign and I'll have maybe to the Lord uh, maybe 20,000 converts and come back in a year. I can't find 20 of them. Oh, I thought this was wonderful. And he said, do you know what's the matter? He said, it's a bunch of you lazy preachers that after we get them into Christ, you sit with your feet up on the desk and write them an invitation instead of going to them and shake their hands and bring them in. That was good. That was very good. It was a fine statement. But, you know, I, I didn't want to be different. But I thought, Brother Billy, who went out and got, what preacher went and got Paul's one convert? Who was the pastor there that was so lazy had his feet up on the table? No, here's what it is. It's because in this day the modern way is to give them the invitation as they are sent out. But brother, that don't tell it. You don't take them deep enough. You don't bring them back to a place to where they get that experience of really being born again. Paul took his convert on through to the baptism of the Holy Ghost and the fire of God was burning in his heart. He didn't need any, whether the preacher is lazy or not. He was on the job to do what God, just his heart was burning with the Holy Ghost and fire. He was out to do the job. That's right. The thing of it is today, our modern theologies and theologians and modern church teachings and so forth, we just pass out the invitations. But remember, after they got the invitation in the oriental custom, when they come to the place to come in, bad, poor, indifferent, all with their invitation in their hand, the son met them at the door. And he took the invitation and he looked it over and he said, it is nice of you so much to say this way for you to accept my invitation. Now, I'll see what size you are. And he fit him up in a robe and then passed him in the door to the banquet hall. Yeah. Glory to God. There's the difference. Peter said on the day of Pentecost, Repent every one of you 
and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promises unto you and to your children and to them it's far off even as many as the Lord our God shall call Paul met some Baptists in Acts 19 and he said have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed they had the invitation but have you got the robe on yet have you been invited to the wedding supper? Yes. Then you must be dressed. Would you go to the president's supper up there if he asked you with your hands all black and greasy and, and you women with your hair hanging down and, you, and your face not washed and your old dirty apron on? No, sir. You would be so out of place. And so a bunch of this lukewarm so-called Christianity be out of place when it hits that heavenly place where they're shouting and praising and rejoicing and singing in the Spirit. So out of place. I was preaching some time ago and a fellow come at would belong to a certain denomination. He said, Billy, I was enjoying your message. But said that woman back there, they kept saying, Amen, and crying, said, she just like to froze me to death. Said, I'm telling you, shivers run up my back. And I said, if she wasn't doing it, shivers would be running up my back. I wouldn't know where I was. Oh, I love to feel the Spirit of God moving among the people, saturating them with the Holy Ghost. He said, oh, that nearly froze me. I said, brother, if you would ever get to heaven, you really would freeze to death because there's going to be shouting and praising God and rejoicing and thousands times thousands rejoicing and singing and praising God when they come into the presence. I might as well get customized here before you get started that way. Amen. Now, the oriental type was for the son to stand there, receive the invitation. Now, Paul's group, I mean, John's group had received the invitation, but Paul said, have you been robed since you have got your invitation? Have you received the Holy Ghost since you have believed? They said, we don't know where there'd be any Holy Ghost. He said, then, what was you baptized? They said, under John. He said, then, John baptized them to repentance, saying on them they should believe on him that has come, that is, on Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And Paul laid his hands on them, and the Holy Ghost came on them. You see the difference? Invitations just come. You're invited. But then when the Son met them with the invitation at the door, then he fit them in a robe. Amen. Now I feel religious. Fit them in a robe. Had one there for their size. And he put the robe on them so that everybody would look the same. You see, there's no big guys. Oh, and people begin to say this Oh, if uh, Brother Branham's are coming to pray for the sick, that don't have nothing to do with it. I couldn't heal no one. There's no big shots with God. We're all His children, every one of us. There's no difference in us. We don't have to have the biggest campaign or the, or the biggest this or the biggest that. That's carnal. God will never... Ble- I doubt sometimes a robe being on a person to act like that. I tell you, brother, God makes us all the same. From the, all of us are of one when we got the robe on. No matter whether they can't talk and don't even know their ABCs or whatever it is, we're all the same in Christ Jesus. That's why I made that remark what I did a while ago. We all want to be the same. Then they put on this robe. Then they come in and they were welcome in the place. They could come in and get at the wedding supper. Jesus said then that in this place he found one man sitting there who didn't have on the road. How did he get in? That was the question. There was one who did not have on the robe. Now remember, he said several places this would happen. Now they come in, he spoke one time, of the rain falling on the just and the unjust. He spoke of one time of the, 
of the wheat in the field and the, the terriers, they both grow together. And many will come to me in that day and sit down in the kingdom with the children. And the children of the kingdom shall be cast out. See? Because that they, they said, Lord, uh, we have did this in your name and we've done that in your name. He said, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. That's the same person that he found there without the robe on. Now, sometimes we refer to people like myself going forth and, and praying for the sick and having a success. That don't mean I go to heaven. See, the person that really gets there was a little surprised when he got there. Man, in that day, they say, when was you naked, Lord, and we clothed thee? When was you hungry and we fed you? When were you in prison and we visit you? He said, in so much as you've done unto these, my brethren, you did it unto me. They, they didn't even think they was worthy to get there. And when we think we're some kind of a big shot, how are we ever going to have a spirit to get there? Sometimes I wonder about the robe then, folks. When we take that attitude that we're bigger than somebody else, better than somebody else, we're a larger number, our denomination's bigger or something. How are we ever going to make it like that? When the rope was to make them all look alike. Yeah. And in the sight of God, we all look alike. Yeah. Certainly, we're sinners saved by grace. Yeah. We must recognize that from the richest to the poorest, from the best dressed to the worst dressed, as the outside dressing has nothing to do with it, it'll perish. But the inside is what lasts. Yeah. I'd rather have my spirit covered with the robe of His holiness than to have the best suits that could be bought in all the world. Sure, rich in the kingdom of God. So, this one man was sitting there, got his place and sat down at the table, sitting there, and the king come in and he found him sitting there. Now remember, he never just uh, said, now I never did know that you were coming or something. Or he said, friend, he didn't rebuke him because he come. He didn't say, now, uh, you should have never come. No, that wasn't it. He said, what should take in place? What are you doing here without a robe on? There's the next thing. Now, folks, to pass your tracks, all right. To speak to a man about God's all right. But don't leave him there. Just keep right after him until you see him at the altar robed in God's righteousness and the righteousness of the Holy Ghost until he's filled with the Spirit. When anyone comes into your church here, an evangelist holds a meeting and maybe he's the one who's giving out the invitations and giving the invitations of friends of Christ, the evangelist, giving out invitations. But when one comes, don't you let him stop there. You take him right on in the presence of God till he robes him. Amen. The wedding supper is soon going to be on. What happened? What could he say? He, the Bible said that he was speechless. He couldn't say nothing. Why? Because he come in some other way besides the door. If he come through the door, the son would have given him a robe. Jesus said, he that climbeth up any other way is the same as a thief and a robber. Yeah. Now you could get there, you'll be in heaven, but you'd be kicked out again. Right. So what good, if they get more, more hell than ever. It's right to know that you were there to see the beauties and then be rejected. You see what I mean? What is this robe? When you wear the robe of Christ, you should have the Spirit of Christ in you. And the Spirit of Christ will act like Christ. It will do the works of Christ. It will be gentle, long-suffering, goodness, me mercy, meekness, patience, with the Holy Spirit, love, joy. Peace, long-suffering. That's the Spirit of God that comes when you're roped with His righteousness. His Spirit lives within you. And this man was speechless. He come by, maybe he said, well, wait a minute. I'm a Presbyterian Methodist or I'm a Pentecostal. That had nothing to do with it. See, he didn't come by the door. And he failed to get a robe. For Jesus said, I am the door to the sheepfold. And if you come, you can't come by the Methodist church. 
You're a thief and a robber. You can't come by the Baptist church. You're a thief and a robber. You can't come by the Pentecostal church. You're a thief and a robber. You've got to come by Jesus Christ. That's the only way you can ever come to him, is to come by Jesus. And when you pass through him, he throws his love or robe around you and leads you to the foe. And we're living on the hallelujah side. Said the Coming by the door. He come up man's way. He come up some way the church's way. He come in some other way. See? But God has a way provided. And that way is Jesus. And when you come by Jesus, you take on Jesus by a spiritual baptism. And you're dead and take on Christ by the new birth. And you're born again and filled with His Spirit. And how you know? Because it's your life would compare with those of the Bible. Those apostles who was robed in his righteousness. Then why can't people who claim to be Christians believe in signs and wonders, divine healing, the working of the Holy Spirit? Why, they should do it. The thing of it is they've come in some other way besides the door. If they come the door, they'd be robed with the same kind of a spirit. They'd have the same kind of life. They'd have the same kind of testimony. They would be the same people. Now you take many times people who climb some other way will have that disgraceful name and say, that's a bunch of holy rollers. Did you know that's what the apostles was called? Do you know John the Baptist was declared a wild man? Did you know Jesus Christ was declared by the Sanhedrin Council an insane man? Now we know you're a mad. Mad means insanity. Do you know all the apostles were declared insane? But I like to what Paul said. In the way that's called heresy, so worship I the God of our fathers. Oh, because he'd been robed in that same righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it is today, friends. So many people are trying to get in, but they're not taking God's provided entrance. And if you go any other way besides Jesus Christ, and when the apostles come into Jesus Christ, when the early church came into Jesus Christ, they received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. It made them a different people. It made them act different, live different. Their whole, their whole life was motivated different. They had different motives. They had different objectives. Everything was different when they come into Christ. Everything's different when you come into Christ. It makes you forsake the world. It makes you forsake the things of the world. You'll turn off your TV anytime to go to church on Wednesday night if you've ever come in on Christ. When there's a prayer meeting, why, there's nothing can keep you away from that prayer meeting. When the love of God that's in your heart that was in Christ Jesus will pull you to the church and when you get there and you get that overflowing joy, there's something that will make you sing out with all that's in you, the praises of God. See, we're coming some other way besides the door. People are coming in and say, well, I come in a Baptist. It's all right to be a Baptist if you come to the door and picked up the robe. You say, well, I'm Catholic. That's still all right if you come to the door and got the robe. But unless you come through the door, you'll be rejected. Because he said it would be. And there's going to be many of them there without the robe on. So remember, friends, when we're taking our people on the street, taking our people in the church, and wherever there is, let not them get by without first coming by Jesus Christ to be born of his spirit, robed in his righteousness, filled with his goodness, and then you got a real convert to Christ. It's later than we think. We've got to work. The time is work. The, the, the message is urgent. Did you notice just in the antediluvian world? Before that Noah, before that the first drop of rain ever fell, Noah went into the ark. And the days of Sodom, before one bit of fire ever fell from the heavens, that the angel said to, to Lot, Make haste, come hither, for I can't do nothing till you come out of there. And when the last of the redeemed was come out, then the fire fell. Now we know that we're close to the end of a, we're right at the door of a global destruction. We know that hanging in the hangars right now is bombs. Did you read the Life magazine, I believe it was a few days ago or weeks ago, where that general said, 
that just the first one to blow his top. That's the expression. And would touch off one of them bombs. What's going to happen? They're already hanging there. They're ready. They can time them by radar and the stars. They can drop one from Moscow right on uh, Vine Street or Sunset Boulevard and Vine. Exactly on the dot, right on the target. Anywhere they want to drop one, they can do it. And we're sitting right out there in the ocean with these big ships. Where you see them the other day, them submarines come up and they wouldn't even let us get near them. With that radar and bomb sitting there, they can put one right on Moscow or anywhere they want to put it. Now what? One of these days, somebody's going to make a slip. And they're going to pull one. And when they pull, there's going to be pulling on this side too. What's the world going to do? It can't stand it. There'll be a burst and a shake and that world will fly to pieces. And that could happen before the sun goes down tonight. A great general speaking on the other day said the next war that takes place will only be three minutes long. Three minutes. No wonder science says it's three minutes till midnight. Three minutes is all it will take to rock the world completely to pieces and blow it up. We're living on barred time. Some fanatic one of these days is going to touch one of them off. And when they out there of them listening post and everything and ears alert, when they hear that first whistle go forth of that bomb going across, they're going to pull them too. And then when that starts, it's going to pull both ways. And here they come. It'll be a constant, completely rocking in this world of going to volcanic ashes. That's all it can do. It can never stand it. One of them bombs will blow a hole in the ground 175 feet deep, 100 miles square. And how about 10,000 of those turn loose on the United States at one time? Where's your living going to be? The world couldn't stand that shock. Even now, till the science is claiming that the, the earth is bulging out in the middle. You've seen that here the other day and heard them talking of it. That there, the waters in the north has went down so many feet, or in the middle of the earth rather, and getting deeper in the north and in the south because the earth is a bulging out. The sun doesn't go around its orbit like it used to. Everything is indicating that coming of the Lord. We're right at the door. And remember... Before one of those bombs can drop. Don't forget this. Jesus said as it was in the days of Noah. And in the days of Lot. So shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. And before Noah for any rain fell down. Noah was in the ark safely. Before any fire fell on Sodom. Lot was outside. And before one bomb can strike it, the church will be home in glory. Gone in. Be sure. Then if this, just to think, friends, if it's that close, how much closer is the coming of the Lord? Because the Lord comes before that happens. Reminds me of a little story once I you, all of you know I used to herd a few cattle and I thought I was a genuine cowboy and so um, I uh, Remember at a ranch that we was working on, there was a, uh, the armor company owned it, really, and the cattle out there, they was branded, and we grazed them. And so they were, the story goes, is before I come on the place, but uh, they had a bunch of young girls, the rancher did, and they were all these little flippy-type girls in them days. I think we call them flappers, and nowadays they're called coarse girls or something. But however, they was... Um, Flapper mothers is what brought forth coarse girls. Now, what's the coarse girl going to bring forth? That's what I wonder. I'll preach one of these nights on sowing to the wind and weeping, reaping the whirlwind. That's what we've done. Now, notice this. Then, before that the, uh, they, the ranch got all fixed up nice and everything, because the armor's boy was coming out to visit the ranch out in the west. And they were going to have a big time. Of course, all these girls were going to vamp the bosses, the head boss's boy. You know, they'd marry him. Well, then they understood it. He was looking for a sweetheart. So they were all fixed up that night. And they was going to really uh, give him an old Western reception. And the shooting their guns and having a big time. And they happened to have a, a girl there, which was a cousin. Her mama was dead. And her daddy was dead. And she had nowhere to go. So she came to live with her uncle. And if all it had to do the work was her. 
The other girls just stayed all prettied up all the time. And she had to do all the work. You, many of you may have had that experience, an orphan. It reminds me of the church of the living God. That's right. Laughed at, made fun of all the time. So she had no clothes seeming to clean up in. When the rancher's uh, son come, the owner's son came. So that night they had a great big blowout and, and she had to stay back in back of the... the uh, bunkhouse and so when uh, they all got out of the dining room from eating why well, uh, she went in and got all the dishes and washed them so it happened to be the the owner Mr. Armour's boy uh, walked out at the back and was looking and it was true he was looking for a sweetheart he noticed that little girl standing in there washing the dishes there's something about her that seemed real to him after a few days visit one night she was pouring out the dishwater at the back of the place after a hard day's work. And she heard somebody say, good evening. And she looked and it was young Mr. Armour. He's standing there and she pulled the straw over her feet. She was barefooted. And she bowed her head. She felt ashamed. He said, I've been watching you. And I have found to what I believe that you are a virtuous young woman. Said, I'm out here. Said, I'm so sick and tired of that fancy going on to the city and Chicago and so forth. Said, I, I come out here to hunt me a wife. And said, you just meet that specification. Oh, her heart like to what? A man of that caliber asked her, a poor little orphan, to marry him. That's about the way I felt one night when I got an invitation to come to the wedding supper. Well, me... A man like me would, would have an invitation to come to the Lord Jesus. But he asked me. I, I, was, I imagine just about it felt about like she did. Who am I? But he told me to come and I come. Then he said to her, he said, now you make yourself ready. One year from this night, I'll be back to get you. So will you marry me? She said, well, it, of course I would. But she said, I'm not worthy. Isn't that about the way you felt? I'm not worthy, Lord. He said, don't think of that. I'm not looking for clothes and things. I'm looking for virtue. And I, I, I want you for my wife. Will you be? And he kissed her. And you remember when the Lord put that kiss on your heart, how you felt? Oh, oh kissed away all my sins and all my... Sorrows, and he just made something different. He he, he said I could. Uh, he's going to bring me to the wedding supper one night. So he said, "Make yourself ready." You remember the Bible said, "And the bride has made herself ready, and the robes are the righteousness of the saints." You see, so that little girl only got seventy-five cents a week, but oh, how happy she was that year! Just washing and singing, saving every penny she could. Rest of them went to town and bought new packs of cigarettes and what more, you know, and their whiskey and carried on new decks of cards and had their big time, but she's just laboring away. <laughs> Why? She was getting ready, making herself ready. And then finally, first thing you know, she got to town and she got the wedding garment and got the money that he sent her and got the wedding garment and come back and did them little cousins make fun of her. Mm. That's just about the way some of these cousin denominational religion, social gospel, said, you bunch of little holy rollers. I talked to a girl here not long ago in Oregon. She said, she's uh, belonged to another denomination. And she said, well, what's tending your party? If, they ever, if they'd be the ones that would be in heaven, I wouldn't want to be there. I said, you won't have to worry very much unless you change your attitude. See? I said, you won't have to worry very much. She said, all that they're screaming and carrying on. I said, now wait, you worship Mary. And the Virgin Mary, before God would ever put the wedding garment on her, she had to go up to the day of Pentecost and get so full of spirit till she staggered like she is drunk. You ain't coming in anything less. I just remember that. Yes, sir. And that was, as you call, the mother of God. See, I said, if Virgin Mary had to go to Pentecost and get the Holy Ghost before she could ever go to heaven, you will never get anything less. Just remember that. That was the Virgin Mary. All that isn't so. I said, do you believe the Bible? <laughs> Here it is. And Mary was right with him in the upper room. And she got so full of the Spirit until she danced under the Spirit, yeah. acting like somebody drunk. And you think you'll get to heaven anything less than that? You'll never do it. 
Yes, sir. Virgin Mary and all the rest of them had to come the way of the Lord's despised few. So, yes, sir. The people make fun and they call them a bunch of idiots. Paul said in the way that's called heresy, that's crazy. See, heresy is some heresy, crazy, idiotics. Well, we are called that because the supernatural is so much different from the carnal things of this world till it makes people think they're crazy. They said, while well, Paul said to Agrippa, said, I'm not mad. <laughs> He's mad means crazy. I'm not crazy. You think I am. But in the way that's called heresy, I worship the God of our fathers. That's the way I do too. I like that. And the way I like to join hands with Paul, I like to be there that day when I see him robed in the righteousness of Christ. When I see him crowned, Hallelujah! I want to have the same kind of robe on he had. That's the same kind my Lord wore. That's the reason I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation. And the gospel came not in word only. But through power and demonstrations of the Holy Ghost. That's the way the gospel is. It's a word made manifest in our hearts. Now, this little girl, she got ready. She didn't care what they laughed. Let them laugh if they want to. But she knowed that that kiss at night meant a seal. And so did I. So do you. And everyone that had that kiss of the Lord Jesus that give you the promise... You know what it means. You don't care what the world says. If your cousins wants to make fun of you and say you've lost your mind and you're old-fashioned, just go ahead. That's all right. Make her no different. She just kept getting ready. So then finally come the hour the sun was going down. So she robed her little self, you know, and got all prettied up. Oh, my. That's the hour the church ought to be in right now. All robed in His righteousness. Filled with His Spirit. Powered with His being. Walking in the light, waiting for the coming of the Lord. There she was, got herself all ready, all cleaned and washed in the wedding garment on. And you know what? As they got closer, the more critical got her little cousins. They said, you poor little simple-minded thing. Do you mean to tell you if if, uh, Armour's son would marry somebody, he would marry somebody like us. Somebody who would fit in his society. Someone who had education, who had some glamour about him. See, that's what the church thinks today, but how far off they are. That's right. Way off they are. They, and so then after a while, she, they, she thought he delayed to get later, later. And finally they said, oh, where's he at? That's what they're saying today. Where is that one? I heard that stuff 40 years ago he was coming. Where's it at? Didn't the Bible say this? Say, where is that coming of the Lord? All things are just like it was from the beginning. We're living in that day, friends. Let's take courage now while we're together this afternoon. Go out with a new courage. Go out to win souls. Get ready. The coming's at hand. And the first thing you know, they all got around her and began to dance little songs around her and said, Oh, we'll make fun of her, you know, and made the uh, bride like they was pretending to bride. That didn't bother her. She watched the little old clock tick around. First thing you know, it's just about one minute. Somebody said, you, I thought he's going to be here at such and such a time. Don't worry, he'll be here, she says. That's all I want to know. He promised he'd be here. That's all I want to know. He's coming, that's all. When I don't know, but he'll be here. Right while they were making the most fun and saying all these different things about her and, and teasing her and making fun of her and everything, they heard the wheels coming. Horses' hoofs are beaten. The old grinding of the sand under the buckboard. My, my, she broke through those lines. (laughs) Out into the yard she went. Who was it? There he was, dressed. The carriage was ready. She run through the little trellis at the end of the yard like that. He jumped out of the carriage and grabbed her into his arms. He said, sweetheart, all year long I've had people watching you. Oh, I'm so glad. (laughs) The Holy Ghost. The eyes is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. All year long, I have been watching him. I've seen your virtues. I've seen the flirts of other men. I've seen all of this, but I've seen you were true. Oh, it swelled my heart to know that the woman I was going to marry was true. God, let that be our testimony. Let that be our desire today. Live true to Christ. Be true to the calling. Be true to the Spirit. 
and he grabbed her in his arms, uh, set her up in the buckboard and turned the carriage away and on to Chicago. Said, you've worked and you've toiled in your little blistered hands. I'll never be blistered again. The things that you've done without, you'll never have to do without again. For one of the swellest homes that can be bought on, on Lakeside Drive in Chicago is waiting for you. We're going to get married now and go live there in peace for the rest of your days. I'm so glad that we might work and toil and have the spit of the outside and the frowns and the scorns and everything. But someday you'll come. Oh, we'll be taken up with him to meet him in the air. And those little old cousins just stood there and looked. Oh, some of these days we'll be caught away. God will catch away his bride. Them who are wearing the wedding garment. Let us bow our heads. Lord, as it is drawing near, how do we know but what that sound will be coming before night? The chariot are coming to take us away. Oh, may we be found ready, robes washed in the blood of the Lamb, perfumed with the gospel, and ready to go meet the bridegroom in the air. May we believe all of his words. Like the little girl, she believed every promise that he made was true. And Lord, we believe it every promise you make is true. You was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon you and with your stripes we were healed. Amen. Oh Lord, to those who are sitting here now that's sick and afflicted, may no promise of God. Oh, may the Holy Ghost move in, put up the robe around him and say, it's me, children. I'm the Lord that heals all your diseases. I'm here now to take away all your afflictions, to take away the sickness from your bodies. Grant it, Lord. May they, as the little girl, just as true to, honorable to every word, to believe it. May the Holy Ghost right now heal every person in here. For I pronounce in the name of Jesus Christ that you heal them 2,000 years ago at Calvary. God, may they all be healed and blessed. And may every worker in here, whether he is a minister, whether they pass tracts on the street, whether they work out here or getting out the paper, whatever they do, Lord, may they know that their labor is not in vain in the Lord. May they just feel that good robe of His righteousness around them. May they enter into the joys of the Lord. Granted, Father, may they not be weary in well-doing, for in due season they'll reap. Father, if there's those here who does not have on that garment that sees the seriousness that they'll be here, the king say that day, how did you get in here? You had an example. You had my parables. You heard the message. You read it in the word. You seen what they did, the first ones that come through the door on Pentecost. That's the way they got it. That's the way they acted. That's the way what they had. That's the lives they lived. And here you are here trying to hold before me a denominational ticket or some other cult or something. You must be born again and be filled with the Spirit. Oh, Lord, God made man tremble, seeing that we're in the last hours and don't know what time our Lord might come. Grant it, Father. May this be a serious moment and man make decisions and women make decisions, young and old make decisions, just now to come and be robed in the righteousness of the Lord Jesus. While we have our heads bowed, our eyes closed, and if there would be those here who has not that wedding garment on, though you've been invited to the supper, but you know you don't have that wedding garment, you still have temper, you still uh, have selfishness, you still criticize the just, you still can't believe God's Word to be true. You think some of it's true because it, the Bible says so. Others you say is untrue because the pastor said so. And the Bible said, let every man's word be a lie and mine be true, said Jesus. Amen. You still can't believe that. Will you come and accept Jesus as your Savior if you don't know Him? Will you raise your hand and say, Brother Branham, it's me, inside or out of this building, wherever you may be, raise your hand and say, I haven't got on that robe. Don't be ashamed. Because it's going to be more embarrassing than ever that day. God bless you, lady. Is there another outside out there? Raise your hand and say, I'm not ready, Brother Branham. God knows I'm not ready. I'll raise my hands to God back in the bag. Bless you, sir. You haven't got on that spirit of meekness and gentleness. If they slap one side of the face, you could actually turn the other. 
and you've got things that bothers you. You say, well, but Brother Branham, I've professed the Holy Ghost for years. But if the fruits of the Holy Ghost isn't there, then you've got on the wrong road. The fruit of the Holy Ghost bears record of itself. The, thank you, sister. You sitting there, even old and gray, perhaps a member of a church, but yet raising hands. You say, Brother Branham, I would like some checking up before the Lord comes. I wouldn't want to be caught in this condition. If you feel that way, while we have our heads bowed, and a brother give us this a little card on the piano, I wonder if you stand right along here and let me pray with you just a few minutes after preaching this message. Won't you come right here now? Set right, stand right here around the altar. Say, I want the robe of the Holy Spirit on me, Brother Branham. I, I need it. Temptations lose their power when thou art near. I need thee, oh, I need thee, every, God bless you. Come now, outside, inside, wherever you make, make your way up here now, that's right, come at the rim. Come right up now. The altar's filling up now. Those who want the robe of Christ on, no matter what church you belong to, that has nothing to do with it. Come on now, if you're not robed. Maybe your last chance. Oh, I need thee every hour. You might say, Brother Branham, I've got an invitation. Come on, get the robe on now then got an invitation come give in your invitation then you're sealed until the day of your redemption I He needs you now. I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come to thee. While the music is playing and people are still coming, just come right on in. That's right from the outside. Come right. On. There's some room on the other side of the altar over here. If you wish to get over a little bit, come right down this other way from this other side. Come right in and come to this side. You're kneel right around the altar. You've got an invitation. Sure you have. Now come be sealed. Now, the scripture, Ephesians 4.30 says this. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed until the day of your redemption. How long? Until the day of your redemption. When you receive the Holy Ghost, you come inside. Like Israel, coming under the blood. They were inside safely, secured, protected from the outside plagues of Egypt. That was going to destroy them. Come into Christ now through the blood. Receive the wedding garment. Christ has given you an invitation to come. Maybe you've held it in some church reverently for years. Come now. Give your invitation to Him and be robed in His righteousness. 
by receiving His Holy Spirit. Won't you come? When thou art near, I need thee. Oh, I need thee. Every hour, I need thee. Oh, bless me now. I come to you. Now, real reverently while the music softly plays, I want to pray now. If all's finished coming, now just remember, Christian friend, this may be the last opportunity. The place where I'm staying, I'm counting the ambulance call since I've been there about 12 days now. There's an ambulance call printer day and night within every 20 minutes. Think of it. Oh, I need thee, Lord. How long will it be before your time's up? You don't know when. Don't take a chance on this, friend. Oh, if you're here and you know you're not right, have you grieved the Holy Spirit so many times from your heart that He doesn't deal with you no more? I'd burst with the faintest little call. You know, His Spirit won't always strive with man. Someday it's going to quit striving. And you can just, He can knock, tell you you're wrong, knock, tell you you're wrong, and you keep wearing it away. After a while, it won't come at all no more. I talked to a young girl down the south some time ago in a Baptist church. I seen her sitting back in the audience, and I said, Young lady at the church, well, I mean, while the altar called, I said, Won't you come give your life to Christ? Oh, my, did she get angry with me. And after the service, she met me at the door. She said, listen here, Mr. Branham. She said, I didn't appreciate that embarrassment, you calling and pointing your finger to me. I said, the Holy Spirit told me to do it. I said, you know you're not right with God. She said, that's my business. I'm too young. She said, I've got to see some life yet. I said, young lady, you may be grieving your, your Lord from your heart the last time. She said, my father's a deacon in that church. I said, if your father was pastor in that church, it wouldn't make a bit of difference. The Holy Spirit's calling you. You better receive it. It might come a time where you want to and you can't. Yeah. And she made fun of me. Stuck her down little painted lips up and turned her head like that sassy and walked away. About a year later, is in Memphis. I come down the street and I looked at that same young woman out of a nice home. Her underneath skirts hanging down, going down the street with a cigarette in her mouth. And I walked up to her and I said, how do you do? She said, hello, preacher. And she looked at me like that. Or she's half drunk. She said, have a cigarette. I said, aren't you ashamed of yourself? She said, maybe you reached down her purse and said, maybe you'd, you'd, you'd take a drink out of my bottle. I said, aren't you ashamed of yourself? I took her by the shoulder and I said, is your father still deacon? She said, I haven't heard from him for a year. I said, I want to tell you something, preacher. She got out a cigarette, put a little shot of dope in it, began to smoke, and her nerves quieting. I stood on the corner, looked at her. She said, you know what you told me that night with them rose bushes? I said, I shall never forget it. She said, you told me the truth. I said, you can say it wherever you want to. But since that night, I'm going to make a remark now that will send shields up your back. She said, since that night, you told me the truth that that was my last call. She said, I, my heart has been so hard till I could see my mother's soul frying hell like a pancake and laugh at it. It just chilled me. I just turned and walked away down the street crying. I couldn't help it. A fine young lady. My spirit will not always strive with me. If you've got the faintest little call in your heart, bring a call up here. This is the place. Once more, and then we'll pray. I need
A Baptist pastor, a friend of mine, preached her funeral about five years later. She was killed in a roadhouse in a fight. And when her old father was rolling her body out the door, he threw his arms around her and said, kissed her, said, goodbye, darling, forever. 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 I need thee. Won't you come, friend? Every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now. Save Lord Jesus. With all that's in me, I have tried to tell the people that they must be robed in the righteousness of the Lord Jesus. Many of them, Lord, no doubt, has already robed and ready. But here are many around the altar that's kneeling here. Their hearts are now tender. It's tender enough that they could hear the Spirit of God calling. And it's written, no man can come to me except my Father draws him first. Here they are around the altar, ready for the robe now. Won't you, Holy Spirit, tenderly, sweetly, gently as only you can do it, put your arm around these little ones. Lead them into this experience of the real riches of God's love by the Holy Ghost that will seal them eternally. Then they'll have the assurance that they are ready for the coming. For the Holy Spirit, we're sealed until the day of His coming. Grant it, Lord, while we humbly are waiting, singing songs like there was on the day of Pentecost, singing hymns, worshiping Him in the Spirit, waiting for the Holy Ghost to come upon these. Bless them, Lord. They're the fruits of this message. The products that your spirit has brought up to the altar. He that will come to me, I will in no wise cast him out. Here they are, Lord, at the door, waiting with the invitation in their hand. Robe each one, Lord. Granted, have mercy, God. While we are waiting, everyone in prayer now for these here. Draw me closer. Closer, Lord, to Let us sing in the Spirit now till we get the Holy Spirit on these people. Uh. Thy healing power Lord, I commit them into Thy hands. Granted, Father, justice do for your glory, Lord. Granted. Yes, Jesus. Shall we stand, please?